welcome again to the Dodcast. I'm Luke Dodson, and Jason Horsley returns for a conversation about his book, Dark Oasis, which focuses on the Canadian spiritual teacher, John DeRuta. to see you again thanks you too it's yeah been, it's been a long while yeah. it's been a while yeah it it seems as though the uh the forces of the cosmos have been conspiring to bring the great jason horsley out of retirement to uh to uh you know engage with the satanic system once again yeah well that that much is true as far as writing anyway i mean yeah. i don't know if it's any more than that at this point, because uh, the John DeRuta thing that that prompted you to suggest us talking, it looks like that was um, looks like it's going to be quite a while before there's any real, uh, you know, controversy around that because the trial isn't even going to start for a year or something like that. Mm-hmm. So initially, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to be back down this rabbit hole, and maybe I will. I mean, I'm. I'm definitely thinking of reaching out to people involved and I may still do that but initially I was thinking the aim would be to update the book as well as connect to these people and see if I could help them in any form uh, but this uh, because of the trial even when the trial begins there'll still be a lot of um, risks in in publishing anything because the risk of a mistrial apparently mm. you know, if anybody s- publicly says anything that pertains to the charges or to the situation then that could be used as a, a way to cause a mistrial so so anyway uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what it what it means currently but it certainly did seem like that and certainly I have been as you know I've been trying to stop writing I did succeed in stopping writing for a while, and then one thing after another has just kind of come up and mm. been back at the keyboard. Mm. Mm. Well, it's it's interesting having revisited the uh, the Dark Oasis book as I've been reading that recently, uh, rereading it, and um, seeing the 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 passages that I'd sort of marked specifically as being really quite resonant with my own experience uh, with another spiritual teacher, which we've spoken about before, but only in private, which is um, uh, hesitant to even name him because I know his lawyers are really, really active and uh, they are very, very effective at scrubbing things from the internet that are... um, in any way uh, unfavorable, so I'll just call him Mr. M. Uh, okay. Mr. M, and um, he's um, he's a kind of he's a dreadlocked version of Osho, essentially. So anyone who knows anything about contemporary YouTube guru celebrities will know exactly who I'm talking about. But um, I'm not going to name him. Um, anyway, so Mr. M is kind of in some ways the opposite of John it seems in many ways he's sort of uh, quite a lively personality um, very funny you know very charismatic um, John doesn't seem to have any kind of sense of humor at all from what I've seen of him uh, I think he got expunged during the remaking process because according to my wife he was he was pretty funny and jokey and affable and so on uh, prior to the involvement with the Van Sasses and his whole yeah. image got a makeover in a fairly rapid period after that. Right. Uh, and I think jokes was one of the, the first casualties of, of the makeover. 
because you can't really do, you know, witty uh, patter when you're spacing out your words by you know, periods of half a minute and the sentence takes a good five minutes to complete. There isn't much opportunity for getting in a bon mot, right? He, he, he does occasionally, or at least when I was with him, there was the occasional joke in the same dead monitor. <laughs> Mr. Deadpan. I guess Stephen Wright managed to pull it off. So. <laughs> um, that's interesting. So his his particular demeanour was something that even your wife noticed he developed over time. Then It changed. She, she, I was the one who really commented on it and zeroed in on it. All she said was that when she was around it was different, like he was different. So, I mean, obviously that implies the change, doesn't it? But she didn't really talk about, or as far as I know, even think about like what happened, when and how. I mean, his image, yeah, she, she certainly uh, emphasised that because he, as you've, I don't know if you've seen one of the early interviews he's, he's done where he's sat in a pair of shorts with, his, you know, man spreading, as they call it now. Uh, and with his long hair, ponytail and beard and stuff, like very much like a, you know, redneck on summer break. Uh, that very obviously changed and she was very clear about that because he started wearing suits and he got groomed and all the rest of it. But what I was referring to more specifically was that he, his manner of verbal deliver- delivery, as far as I could see, changed quite rapidly and unmistakably soon after or congruent with uh, when he came out and admitted that he had been sleeping with the Von Sasses for um, however long it was while pretending he hadn't, while basically lying about it. But it was a massive spin operation, not massive in the sense of loads of operatives, but the elaborate uh, manner in which he performed it was quite massive. Um uh, I got slightly distracted there, so I wonder if we had bandwidth problems. But you're still hearing me, yeah? Yeah, it's fine. I, I've seen this sort of thing flashing up on the the corner of my my little window, but I think it seems to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see you. All right. I mean, it, it freezes up a little bit, but um. Anyway, uh. It, he just slowed down. I mean, he slowed down an awful lot, and it seemed to me that the two things were, must be related. Because I don't, I don't, I had no reason to think that the von Sassers advised him to start speaking more slowly. That just doesn't seem very likely. It doesn't seem very congruent with. It, just, it seemed more like something that he would was moving into a, strategically, or for whatever other reason. Uh, Anyway, I could theorise about that, but I'll just keep to the facts. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it seems plausible, perhaps, given the the timing of it, that as he was involved in a situation which he kind of had to frame as being led by the spirit, or something along those lines. That the was, truth, yeah. Yeah, the truth was leading him to to sleep with these these two women and outside of his marriage as well. Um, and that he then developed this manner as though everything he said and did had to come across like it was being guided by some sort of inner force, like he was channeling something. Um, but again, that's that's kind of speculative. Yeah, well, for the listeners who aren't familiar with this, um, the main thing here, the main point I would want to make is, is that uh, he was lying to Joyce for a period, however, however long it was, might have been a year or more, I don't know, I don't remember, but because she kept asking him, because he was spending all this time with these sisters and, and wherever it was in the basement, I think, but obviously very private, intimate time overnight, staying up all night and stuff. So she kept asking him and he kept 
denying it, but in a very Bill Clinton-esque way, like, what do you mean by is? But in his case, it was, <clears throat> what do you mean by adultery? Or rather, essentially he was saying, no, it's a movement of being, it's a movement of truth, it's got absolutely nothing to do with sex or sexual desire. <clears throat> but eventually it came out that he was do, it, he was just playing a game with semantics, language, because he was saying, well, yeah. from his point of view, it had nothing to do with what Joyce was asking about, which is whether he was committing adultery, whether he was having sex with these sisters. Uh, well, I mean, now I just kind of freeze up because that's where the the kind of perception management goes off the chart. Like anyone who isn't already indoctrinated would go, well, what the fuck? How can anyone get away with saying, when you, I didn't know what you meant when you said where you're having sex with them because from my point of view, it wasn't sex, it was a movement of being, right? But actually you find mm. this quite common among guru spiritual teachers. If their followers will say, well, it's got nothing to do with sex, even mm. though the penis is going into a vagina, etc., <clears throat> and perhaps much worse places, uh, I don't know, but certainly it can involve all kinds of deviations, I think, uh, but it's not about sex because it's it's a tantric master, it's an embodiment of truth, it's a fill in the blank, it's a god man. Therefore, he or sometimes she isn't motivated by ordinary hormonal desire, by lust or anything like that, but by truth, God, the spirit, and so on. So anyway, so he he used language in that way. That was the time that he most obviously observably began to use language in this way that politicians use it and spiritual teachers um, to manipulate perception. And so it also makes sense he would slow down then as well, but as far as strategically, like he can't be as loose and free and easy with language if he's much more closely uh, controlling how it's being used. Mm. Mm. So... Sort of go back to the beginning, maybe, um, for kind of clarity for listeners, but also sort of get a, a general sense of the context here. So, so basically, John DeRuta is Canadian. Uh, he's, I think, he's from Dutch extraction. Is that right? He was a shoemaker. Yeah. He became a pastor in a Lutheran church or some sort of Protestant church, I think. Lutheran. Uh, Lutheran, and and then gradually sort of moved away from a traditional Christian uh, theology framework and it sort of cobbled together this very vague mishmash of, of sort of spiritual ideas. Um, at what point did you encounter him? Uh, 2008, through the woman that became my wife, who had been living in Edmonton and going to meetings in 2000, around that time, the time of the Von Sasses, for a, a few years. I forget the exact sequence, but she was there for a few years. But she had, she was not involved with him by the time she told me about him, but she was still, she still had this very strong positive impression of him. So she told me about him, and then uh, uh, he came to London soon after that. This was right after the period I met David Shana. So I actually met both David Shana and John DeRuta in a similar time period and had very different impressions. And it was John DeRuta who really um, impressed me as the kind of the kind of human being that I could, as it turned out, s submit to, or subjugate myself to, uh, because he, he somehow he fit not just with my psychological patterns, fathers and stepfathers, which it took, you know, it was only later that I started to look into that, but with my more conscious idea of what I was looking for, which was Don Juan Matus from. Castaneda's books, like I was literally looking for Don Juan Matas if he was still around in my 20s because I went to, to Oaxaca, Mexico and sat on the bench or tried to find the bench that they sat on. And I was literally trying to find somebody who's part of that world. 
which is a very different world in you know, shamanism and sorcery from the spiritual scene. But somehow, John, to me, he was a bridge. Like I, for the first time ever, I got into the spiritual seeker pool by via my contact with him because something about him impressed me as I imagined that somebody who was a higher level of consciousness should be like. I, mean, I don't know why, because Don Juan Matas is not described in any way as anything like that. But he is described as kind of, as superhumanly powerful, as, as beyond human, and certainly John Deruta had this beyond human um, persona that I fell for. Mm. So your initial impression was, this is a guy who's really got it. Like this is, you know, this is someone who's radiating this kind of spiritual energy, almost power. Well, I should say it wasn't my initial impression because my initial impression was via YouTube. And I thought, who the hell is this guy? Why does he talk so damn slow? And it looks pretty cheesy to me. And then even when I went to the meeting in London, which was at the center point, which I write about in the book, was mm. actually in its early days, was this a locus for a Crowley ritual, which obviously didn't seem trivial when I discovered that as a fact. Or a fact. Um, uh, so even at the meeting, uh, I had a kind of negative impression in terms of, I found out that even if I spoke, I wouldn't get a copy of the recording. I didn't like that, the kind of admin bureaucracy of it. Uh, I didn't pay to get in, so I didn't want to give my money to this. I just snuck in. I didn't have to sneak in. I just walked in. And um, and then I signed up to speak. And then while I was waiting for the guy before me to finish, I was listening to what John was saying to that guy, and I was kind of rolling my inner eyes, thinking, you know, this doesn't sound like anything. But I was just telling myself to wait, to wait and see what it was like when he spoke to me directly. And so it was only when he spoke to me directly that all of that scepticism began to cease to protect me. Right? I just, I became bait. You know, I was, I was an easy prey once I was in his gaze. Mm. Well, this is the thing that he became notorious for was his gaze. I remember watching some something like Charlie Brooker's TV show when he had a TV series and um, he had a piece on the staring guru and it was John DeRuta and um, and it was all very it was all very sort of uh, cynical and dismissive of this like he just gets paid for staring at people isn't that ridiculous sort of thing yeah. um, and it just had these shots of him just kind of like you know looking at various different members of the audience um, this is exactly what Mr M does as well uh, so Mr M kind of intersperses these long drawn out silences where he's looking at different Call it, they call it the Darshan. Um, and um, then he sort of, he met, he uh, he modulates the pace a bit more than John, I think. So there'll be these almost quasi guided meditations where he's speaking. It's this very slow tone. Can you perceive that which is seeing all that kind of pseudo advice and nonsense? And then he'll kind of, at certain points, he'll kick up the pace and even make sort of dirty jokes. I remember he he made one joke about um, trying to find the G spot and then saying, oh, I meant God spot. I don't know what you were referring to. Um, and sort of this kind of like, this little hint of there's something else going on. Different to John, but there's a lot of overlap. Um, I wouldn't even be surprised if um, Mr. M had taken on some 
get some inspiration from John and Lisa. Yeah, the timing of that would fit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, because I don't know anything about Mr. Dam except what you told me. Uh, but there does seem to be a template, and whether it might be too soon to get to this, and if we're going to stay on specifics, but it does seem to be a template for the spiritual guru uh, who abuses his power to get sexual gratification and energy power via sexual abuse uh, or manipulation, at least, coercion. Uh, there seems to seem to be a template. I mean, beyond what is, it's just a cliche, obviously. So, but I mean more than it being a cliche, like a template, like this, mm. this is a sort of entity, uh, entity, uh, structured grid, uh, like almost like a, it's almost like a technology, I'd say. It's an invisible technology, an invisible tech of entities and cities and whatnot. Mm. Uh, that you you kind of have to use if you're going to do that, right? So I think they all, pretty much all end up, well, however many do anyway, I'm not going to disparage countless out there, I don't even know their names, but whichever spiritual gurus, teachers end up doing that, they, they tend to do it more or less in similar ways, it seems. Mm. Mm. Yes, uh, you mentioned entities, which is an interesting uh, interesting word in this context because I remember uh, another friend of mine who's um, who knows someone very close to him is involved with John and has been for a while um, had mentioned that certain people in John's audience will kind of see him as being this strange kind of alien like literally an alien being with sort of, you know, multiple eyes and sort of all kinds of strange things going on, um, which sort of indicate, I don't want to speculate too much as to what, what that might be, but that kind of indicates some sort of um, matrix of psychic strangeness with an entity with an entity flavor at the very least going on around him uh, was that something that you experienced yourself with, with john not really i mean i certainly had what we might call paranormal experiences uh i didn't hear any of the alien stories until later until i was writing dark oasis and asking people who'd left him, what their impressions were. I didn't ever hear it from somebody who thought positively towards hmm. JDR. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I don't quite know how to approach it as a subject because it's, well, it is highly speculative. Um, hmm. But I will say, I mean, bringing it slightly uh, away from the entity thing, not that I'm averse to talking about the entity, it's just that it's difficult to know what angle of approach to take, but that I never really doubted after that, those first moments, that J John had unusual powers. Hmm. Uh, there's never been a point. So you know, even when I really began to think that he was not benign or even malign, malevolent, which I do pretty much think to this day, uh, I never doubted that he was powerful, so that became quite shocking to me to think of somebody who was as powerful as he appeared to be, who was also possibly malevolent. Mm. Uh, anyway, yeah, I won't, I won't say any more on that. Mm. Mm. In the context of this sort of technology, as you put it, this... Uh, set of methods, techniques, possibly other more subtle factors that are coming into play with people like John, Mr. M. Um, one interesting sort of nexus point that connects a lot of these people up is uh, Ramana Maharshi. And whether directly or indirectly, it seems like Ramana Maharshi, who, um, for any listeners who 
if not heard of him, Ramana was um, uh, an Indian guru uh, of the non-dual tradition of uh, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, uh, who lived in South India. And um, as far as I can tell from my own sort of investigations of these gurus and their dirty laundry, uh, Ramana was pretty much um, legitimate. You know, I, I can't find any evidence that he was particularly untoward um, or dishonest uh, towards anyone. Uh, the worst, the worst thing I've I've come across about Ramana is that he once berated his kitchen staff for giving him a larger portion of curry than the others. He was sort of saying, this is really, you know, I should be served exactly the same as everyone else because I'm no better than anyone else. And so the kind of the co contradiction of also berating them with a, from a position of authority. That, sure. <laughs> that I'm no better than anyone else, so you aren't to treat me any better than anyone else. But that's in itself, that's, that's sort of consistent with his general, uh, his stated ethos, it seems to me. Um, however, it seems like a lot of these sort of gurus of today have taken on either directly in some way in the sense that they were, um, they were taught by him in some way or that they were taught by someone who was taught by him. So Mr. M is a, a case and yeah, there's a few others that sort of come from that supposed lineage. I say supposed because he never actually appointed any formal successors. There's only been people who self-appointed themselves. Um, but also indirectly in terms of creating a certain um, I won't use the word created actually because that sounds too he set what appears to others to be a template for how a guru should speak because if you read the transcripts of his dialogues it's very um very easy to see how someone could attempt to emulate that and become quite successful. So there's a sort of like a formula that you, you can extract from it. Mm. It's like who's this who is the person who's telling me that that this is the case or you know who, who are you in relation to the rest of the cosmos, which is not different from you, and all this sort of this kind of non-dual patter? And if you get quite accomplished at that, um, then you can really go far in the sort of dodgy guru world. Um, and I noticed that John Deruta had actually spoken in Tiruvannam um which is where uh, Ramana was based. So You're he was breaking sort of, up a little bit. What was the last thing you said? Um, so that John Deruta had actually held events in Tiruvannamalai in South India, um, which was where uh, Ramana lived. So on some level, he's trying to um, evoke that um, that lineage, you know, that tradition. Yeah, well, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that because, as I said, I mean, I don't know anything about the lineages and stuff. I've just never been interested in spiritual teachers per se. <laughs> it might surprise people to hear me say that because I'm currently still working with David Shana, who identifies as a spiritual teacher but makes it very clear to those who get involved enough well, actually, I mean, anyone who happened to go to a meeting where he does talk about this, that that it's just a disguise that he, he has adopted because one has to have some sort of public persona and some sort of apparent, um, you know, service that one's offering. And he, he just ended up taking on the guise that is necessary to be part of the spiritual marketplace, but 
he doesn't, as far as I know, his only interest is in lineages and stuff and other teachers is, is similar to mine in terms of exposing the, the distortions, the corruptions and the manipulations uh, mm. because there are so many victims, you could say, if that's not too strong a word, but, you know, people who've been dece- deceived. And But, you know, my interest, as, as you know, is... It, it, in that regard, extends beyond the spiritual marketplace, what I call the second matrix, because, um, I mean, I don't see that there's much, there's any hope for, for the vast mass of humanity to ever awaken, to use the lingo, to ever actually um, become conscious of who they are and where they are and what's happening uh, in eternity. But there, there's... There is a small percentage which are at least moving towards that, and it seems to me that there is a lot of focus, there's a lot of um, quite elaborate edifices to 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 prevent them from ever awakening, to lure them into a false sense of discovery and meaning, which is what I call the second matrix. So spiritual teaching obviously fits into that. And what what percentage of those spiritual teachers are in fact not what they seem, deceived, deluded, or just, you know, consciously self-serving slash serving entities. Uh, I would say it's a very high percentage. Uh, so it, would, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the, the most, if not all, of the lineages we, we know about that can be identified are lineages that were compromised very early on, even if there was... I mean, look at Christianity. Like, that's died good. Jesus and Jesus at least was good. Um, although even Jesus said, don't call me good, right? So that was kind of proof that he was good enough to know he wasn't perfect. Um, but obviously, I mean, that's, we don't have a clear historical thing around Jesus, but there's definitely something, someone. And then, but then even the apostles were a bit, you know, they had feet of clay a little bit. So you could see even right there the people that, that Jesus was working with directly, that there was definitely some mission creep potentially going on. And then it's Peter and Paul and, and so on and, and the Catholic Church, well, yeah, and the Roman Empire. So obviously that didn't last long in terms of, oh, it's ironic because it was John DeRuta's sign he had over his shoe cobbler's thing was Christianity is Satan's masterpiece. Well, that's kind of the point that I'm making, which is that the the anti-life force essentially knows how to get its tentacles in absolutely everything except what is what is absolutely pure, you know, the pure transmission of the spirit. It can't it can't access that. But anything that builds up around that through human beings that involves teachings, disciplines, systems, ideologies, uh, institutions, yeah, of course Satan's right in there at the, at the starting gate, <laughs> just waiting to to co opt it. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's a very general point. The other one I thought might be worth mentioning was that I, I, I had no sense of John de Ruta following a lineage and he certainly wouldn't admit to it because he, he claims to be created to whole cloth. Like he claimed that Jesus was his teacher actually in the early days. He later suppressed that. I didn't talk about that. Um, but uh, I myself imitated John. Like I, in the period that I was following him most devotedly, I had my own little group, and I was introducing them to the recordings of John, and I was promoting John to them as I believed him to be, as the living embodiment of truth. And I was um, developing a way of speaking and communicating that was a bit like satsang also, at least one-to-one, like with the one-to-ones I would have with these people, mostly guys, I would imitate John, like, consciously, not like I'd try to imitate his accent or anything ridiculous, but in terms of speaking very slowly, not not moving hardly at all, really just waiting for what I thought was a movement of being to come from within, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I thought I did it very well, and others did too. Uh, and I think I had some genuine insights, and I genuinely felt that I was trying tuning into, tapping into, and transmitting uh, the same kind of divine guidance that that John was. Right? So I, I persuaded myself, and I persuaded others. 
And that was, to a large extent, that was from the outside in. So anyway, now I would say, you know, what was I doing? And partly I was, it was self-hypnosis. Partly it was real. Like I, I did have, I do, and I did have a connection to my soul and to the spirit. And I was trying to nurture that and amplify it. But then partly I'd say that there's some, this entity grid or this tech that we're talking about was involved. And I plugged into the tech and the entities were like, sure, we'll help you out. Because all the, you know, all the energy you're harvesting, we know where we're going to send it, right? Mm. We're sending it to their Lord and Master. That's why I mean, it might seem a bit paranoid Christian viewpoint, but I'm trying to keep it simple. Mm. Right? Mm. If we see there's exploitation, manipulation, deception, and, and etc., then we can assume that uh, the, 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 something is benefiting that is not ourselves. So, you know, where is it? What is it? And it's not just John Deruta getting his trucks and his, 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 you know, sex. There's more to it than meets the eye. Mm. Mm. Well, there's the the concept of the egregore that could be relevant here, which I think has been Mark Stavish has written about this, but I, th- I think it was already kind of um, already floating around. Yeah. Um, which is the sort of the, the aggregation of psychic energy in a particular group. It creates a sort of a force field that then, in theory, uh, if one is open to the the notion of, uh, sort of non-human intelligences, non-physical intelligences, that can then act as a kind of like um, uh, uh, a line of communication or a line of connection to other forces. So there's a sort of uh, uh, a mass formation, I suppose mm-hmm. you could say, yeah. is created in Smith's term, and then that in itself then that can then connect onto other entities. Um, but then it get, that's, that's quite speculative in this case. Um, but it does. No, at a certain sense. point, it becomes speculative, absolutely. And one can even, one maybe even has to speculate whether an entity is an egregore or at what point does an egregore become an entity? Um, mm. and it's a, it's somewhat of a choice there how one chooses to interpret it. But I think the, uh, certainly the idea of mass <laughs> Formation of egregores in the sense of condensed, uh, combined energy of human consciousness. These these are observable realities. It's just we don't generally have the language for them. Hence, you get a fancy word like egregore that you have to explain it or mass formation. Mm. Uh, but we all we all know it. We all experience it. If you go to a movie theater and you watch a movie with a bunch of people, you have a completely different experience to if you watch it alone at home, right? It's, 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 it's observably qualitatively different because you become part of the collective conscious attention of the people in the mm. cinema or a rock concert is a better example because you're more likely to get swept away by mass hysteria, as it's called. I don't like that term because it's misused, but et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's, a, it, it it's not speculative to begin with, but a certain, you know, at what point does it become speculative? This is the thing with entities. Entities uh, might seem to be wholly speculative, but certainly once upon a time they weren't. People had somewhat direct experience and there was a consensus around them, so there wasn't much need for speculation because everybody was agreeing, yeah, I saw it too kind of thing. And number two, even today, while there isn't a consensus, Lots of people have direct personal experiences, I do, of entities uh, that I can talk about and describe. It's just that they're isolated. So if a person sees a ghost, that doesn't prove that ghosts exist or what ghosts are or anything like that. All it proves is they have an experience and so on. So, But to the extent anyway that we have had personal experiences of, of entities, then it's not speculative. But in terms of what they are and how they function, all of that, there's just no agreement of uh, but and we can bring it back again to this template of spiritual teachers who abuse their influence and how similar it is and this question I mean it's definitely about attention and energy which is what the Kubrickon is also about this book I just wrote out um, 
So it's a, it's a, so it's a very essential theme in Big Mother too, like how we're being manipulated also the last two years, three years with COVID and the mRNA. Uh, these are all, you know, like burningly relevant questions that you can look at in many different fields, but certainly in the spiritual marketplace and the untrustworthy, untrustworthy guru is a good one for it. It's a, I mean, what's called a cult, right? <laughs> that's what it's called, but that's a word to use with caution because it presumes that other things aren't cults. If you identify one thing as a cult, you're, you're implicitly saying that other, you know, other things that people are involved with aren't cults. Whereas in fact mm. they are, like the medical in- industry is a cult, the CIA is a mm. cult. That's a really interesting point because having browsed a little bit around the kind of um, cult awareness, cult education world from my own experiences, just from general interest in these sorts of things, uh, I have noticed that there tends to be a, um, a consensus view that the mainstream dominant culture is not a cult. The mainstream cult isn't the cult and that it's all these other cults that are the, the dangerous ones. And, you know, they, they may be talking about some quite relevant and um, deserving targets in some case, but then it's also they bring in elements. Oh, well, they don't believe in um, mainstream medicine, you know, um, as if that's, one of the reasons to damn them. It's like, oh, they don't believe in mainstream medicine, these ones. Or, you know, they're all into QAnon weird conspiracy theories about how paedophiles are running the world and all this sort of thing. Um, obviously, QAnon is a is a, a misinformation campaign, but it's not... I don't think it comes from the source that they think it comes from. You know, the QAnon is, is the sort of the second matrix that you were talking about. These things are the second matrix that are um, catching people who are falling through the cracks of the first one. Yeah. And giving them sort of false reality to inhabit. Yeah, which has to resemble the true reality more closely than the mainstream thing. It's ironic. I mean, that's what makes it the second matrix, the matrix 2.0. But also it's ironic mm-hmm. because the things identified by the, the the supreme cult of, of mainstream society, which is, you know, proves its supremacy by not having to be identified as a cult because no, no, no one's big enough to identify it that way. Um, I forgot what I was saying there, the irony. Oh, yeah, that, that the cults being identified by mainstream society often tend to be closer to reality or to, you know, to a perception that's real than rather than further away. It's, and that's part of the, I was going to say infamy, but the, um, the fanaticism of a cult, so-called cult, of a smaller cult, is that it has, it feels it has to, and to some extent does have to, um, create a, a buffer or a bulwark against the, the pressure of mainstream society. So it has to become somewhat fanatical just to withstand the constant efforts to, um, assimilate it. The Jews are coming to mind mm-hmm. now, actually, because, you know, they're famous and slash infamous for maintaining their identity, their cultural identity within mainstream society, which has also made them, uh, susceptible to persecution. I and mean, that's central to one of the reasons they've been persecuted is that they've constantly tried to remain somewhat separate from the rest of society. Mm-hmm and maintain their integrity as a cultural slash racial group. I didn't think we'd be getting to the Jews. We'll just, we'll move on quickly here. But just as an example, like there is this need, really, if you want to retain your integrity as a group, as a community, uh, to, to somewhat become cult-like, how else, how else would you do it? Right? How else would you define your, your non-assimilation by the mainstream except by having a somewhat insulated uh, community group that has beliefs that that are counter contrary to the mainstream beliefs mm. Mm. Well, the, 
the notion of schismogenesis is something that comes to mind here as the um just distracted by the little thing saying my connection's shoddy can you hear me all right now yeah i just could never see you really i mean you're just uh, clicking on and off it's apparently it's automatic okay. that's um that's acceptable um that as um as the, the, the fissure grows between the mainstream and the fringe groups, that um, uh, they sort of start to emphasise their differences more. Um, but without wishing to go into too much general topics, unless that's where you would go, I'd be very happy to do that. But it, it does seem also something that's happened more over the past two, three years now is that actually as the mainstream has become increasingly obscene and obnoxious in a very visible way, and I mean, even more so than before, which was quite apparent, uh, it's got to the point where in order to prove your adherence to the mainstream, uh, you have to comply with measures that are um, uh, contrary to one's personal uh, well-being uh, in ways that seem to many of us to be really quite glaringly obvious. So it seems like more and more people have actually fallen through the cracks of the mainstream now. Um, where, you know, where does that leave us now with the second matrix? It seems like there's a lot of second matrix... Uh, operatives at work I can think of a few by name I won't name them but you know sort of many figures in the alternative scene who are raising some very very legitimate questions about what's going on yeah it seemed to me a little bit surprising where, where they come from you know really you were saying this now you were, you were big brother presenter and now you're I'm not discounting the possibility it could be gen genuine because I don't know, but there, there seems to be something going on. There. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was also distracted to have other. I wasn't sure if you'd stop speaking or if you'd got cut off. Um, I was thinking of a couple of things, but. I was thinking of bringing it back to John a bit in terms of something more specific. Uh, and I think it very much what we're talking about, to me anyway, has to do with numbers. You can still hear me, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is back to the tech and what have you, because if we think about it in the literal terms, like how does a person reach a wide audience? How does someone become David Icke or, or Robert Kennedy Jr.? is not a good example because he was already famous before he started, you know, he, he was from a lineage, but Russell Brand and so on, <clears throat> Alex Jones, how do these uh, controlled opponents, I would say, whether they were created that way or they just were, they became useful. Well, Jordan Peterson is a good example, like, because it seems like Jordan Peterson came pretty much out of nowhere. And it seems plausible to me that his rise was, wasn't being controlled, that it was something that was only observed by, certainly not by entities, because who knows what level of anticipation they have. But, and in fact, Jordan Peterson's rise did seem to relate to, to Keck, that entity. In terms of him mm. being possessed by Kermit the Frog and putting on the frog mask right before he he made it big, um, but that's a side point. Uh, he he did become big in a way that could well have been organic, um, but at a certain point, I mean, clearly the powers that be noticed that, and then they're going to do everything they can to co-opt and control that particular person so that they become a controlled opponent rather than an uncontrolled opponent. And uh, that has to do with things that you and I and probably your listeners know all about, compromat and all these different methods to put handles on somebody and make them controllable. In the case of Jordan Peterson, well, he 
he got taken out of the game and he you know he got extremely sick and he couldn't get treatment he ended up in a coma in russia and god only knows what was happening to him while he was there and now he's writing for ben shapiro's site uh and promoting the war in ukraine right so from what i hear anyway mm-hmm. i don't follow the guy but um so that that's a case study that could be examined in terms of how does a, a perhaps genuinely subversive voice get co-opted, how and why. And But the relation is, is to numbers, I think. I mean, it's very easy to see that if, a, if a, a particular individual who has subversive potential to the powers that be, I mean, is seen that way as a threat, um, reaches... A certain number of people, then, then something has to be done about them. That's pretty obvious. But what's not so clear to me is, is that uh, can a person really reach and and maintain a positive influence over a large number of people without being co-opted? And so the literal mm. thing is the tech. The literal tech is well, a person. And we've all got the tech of just the internet. But then there's the tech of the algorithms that keep promoting you and make sure that you actually, right? That That's all controlled. So it seems easy to say that Jordan Peterson or anyone that we've heard about, David Icke, etc., if they were truly a threat, um, the, we, we really wouldn't be hearing about them. I and mean, they'd either get taken out of the game completely like Julian Assange or they, or they, the, there are ways just to, so that we just don't hear about them. I mean, all these articles about Jordan Peterson and how bad he was, well, obviously that was just making him more and more famous. Alex Jones gets this huge lawsuit. He was already big before that, but this has given him more credibility and so on and so forth. Um, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, there has to be some sort of high level, at least tolerance, if not support, for somebody to reach large numbers of people. But then, then there's the invisible tech of the entities, which has more to do with what kind of uh, fluency or gifts or charisma or cities are being bestowed upon you so that you can hold sway over thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of people, assuming that there's any positive outcome of that, right? Assuming, which I don't, in fact, this is the point I want to make, that once one individual starts holding sway over hundreds of thousands of people, or perhaps even thousands, or perhaps even hundreds, because this, this is John Deruta, um, entities are involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of what we talked about earlier, an egregore is created. Because you can't have direct, intimate, one-to-one relations with all those people. You can sit and stare at all of them and you know, move your eyes over the whole room, but you, there's no time to just be constantly checking in. You know, I contrast this with Dave O'Shaughnessy thing. He never has more than 20 people, more or less, at a meeting uh, and that are currently mm-hmm. involved in his meetings. His group never grows beyond about 20 people, and he jokes about it. And it's not that he doesn't try to reach more people, and it's not that he wouldn't let more people in, in theory, but in practice, he doesn't. He does stop people coming in, not because of the number, but just because they're not ready and so on and so forth. So it's quite organic. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be involved in, in Dave's thing if there were, even if there were 50 people, never mind 400, as John Deruta had at one point, um, because it's it becomes worshipful. It becomes inevitably worshipful if you just have one guy uh, or one woman talking and you have hundreds of people listening. That's that's mm. that's um, a template, and back to the egregore, really, of, of, of attention energy harvesting. I would mm. say. Anyway, I've just talked about it and made a lot of different points there, but hopefully they, they cohere into some sort of uh, meaning. I did think it would be good to get to the specifics of John Deruta, again, just so we're grounded in in, in the specifics of something, um, but I'm not mm. sure what, what would be at the relevant point here uh, exactly. Um, I mean, maybe his MO, I mean, his MO, and, 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 yeah, we could connect these things and see if this leads to something, which is that he was all about recruiting. You mentioned he traveled to these places in India and so on. Uh, he, he recruited a whole bunch of sannyasins after Osho died. 
he was con- wow. he's constantly traveling the world. He's constantly telling people, hinting or just telling them out right, to move to Edmonton to try and increase his flock, right, to make it bigger and bigger. Well, we know from the facts that that meant he got richer and richer, fatter and fatter like a cow. Uh, now he's a multimillionaire, has been for uh, 10 years or more since the Von Sassers, I'd say. And, but we also know that he get more and more women that he was having sex with. Um, I, I can't, don't want to mention specifics here because some of it's not in the papers, but it's a lot. From what I've heard, it's a lot of women that he's been, he's been having sex with and by inference, harvesting the energy, you know, mm. in a more direct way, he calls it the calling. Um, He's harvesting energy by staring at people, having people stare at him, by filling up a, a, an auditorium with people with a worshipful attitude. But then if he's actually having physical sex with all these women, possibly men, but I've never heard even a rumor about that, um, he's more directly harvesting that energy that way as well, I would say, if he knows how to do mm. it, I assume he does. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of threads to pick up there. Yeah, One sorry, thing sorry. Like, shotgun blasted you. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, go for it. It's, um, it's the best way. Um, one thing I one thing I noticed with John Deruta is something that I think I experienced with Mister M, which is like you encourage the audience to look at you in such a way as you're focused on just them and when you do that this very strange perceptual effect happens that um, it's like everything else sort of disappears and they become the this sort of they almost start to emit a beam around them yeah um, golden tunnel is a phrase that's been used with John Deruta yes yeah, and and that was something that I experienced with Mr. M. Um, never never experienced anything like that really with Dave O'Shana from my encounters with him. That it's sort of like Dave O'Shana seemed to kind of bat that away a little bit. Like I think that there's a the, the potential for it to happen, but it seems to, that it wasn't something that really um, was encouraged from my experience. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, there's undoubtedly some sort of energy harvesting going on with that. There's also this sort of, um, uh, kind of hypnotic auto suggestion of, of creating a, a sense of an aura that is actually not a real aura that people who, people who say that they can perceive auras and things say that it's very different seeing an organic aura around someone um which is just that sort of little personal energy field is quite distinct from when you stare at someone on a sitting on a stage with some incense and some spiritual things happening and that creating the sense of an aura that isn't a real aura um Yeah, where where the um, where suggestion ends and sort of actual cities begin and sort of magic powers, psychic powers begin. I, I don't know in this particular case, but it goes with the territory of these types to um, to fake a lot of it. Um, I, I know in particular case of Mister M. They would plant recording devices around the ashram so that they could listen in on private conversations. And then he would get the information from that and he would say things relevant to their personal lives that they think they thought he couldn't possibly know about to create a sense of this guy. Wow, this guy has some real powers, you know, um, what I find remarkable is that he managed to find people who are willing to facilitate that in themselves. They're kind of devoted to creating the image of him 
even though it wasn't their image. But on some level, they must have been sort of lured in to the point where they were getting some parasitic benefit from it as well. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, pick up some friends if you, uh, if you so feel. Yeah, well, I think it's... Um... It was making me think when you said parasitic, I thought you were going to say parasocial, actually. And of course, those words are very similar. Um, and, uh, and it is making me think of uh, the parasocial relationship that people have with celebrities. Uh, like, why do we do, and it's back to this thing of numbers. Like, if you, if you uh, follow somebody, if you are influenced by somebody who has thousands or perhaps millions of followers, um, you can't possibly have a personal direct relationship with them. I mean, even if they answer your emails, they're going to be very brief and perfunctory. Chances are, um, unless you're female and they want to have sex with you or, or if it's a woman, vice versa, right? unless there's that element. Um, so, so what do you get out of it? It's a question where well, you get, you know, there's people who worship celebrities, they get the feeling of, um, a proximity to something that's divine and thereby they get a feeling of being divine by proxy. So, I mean, why do people mm. worship, why do people worship gods? And I mean, gods in the pantheistic sense, because I'm not going to include monotheism just yet in this, although it certainly could include that. But, but if you have particular deities, um, I mean, in Mashimon, they worship a deity like Mash, uh, in Guatemala, sorry, they worship a, a deity like Mashimon or a saint. Uh, four specific favors they would get, which is very close to what a guru, what the real meaning of guru in India is. I mean, it's heavy. It literally means a heavy. And it's a bit like a capo, like a, a mafia, a made man who can provide all kinds of favors for you if you, if you, you know, give him what he wants or her. Uh, and if we include cities in those favors, well, it's off the charts, really. So, there's certainly something that your average person gets if they're so inclined, and most people are, by um, feeding their energy of attention and adoration to to an individual, even though they're never gonna, they know they're never going to attain the, the level that that individual is on. In fact, in a way, it's a perfect um, arrangement for an entity infested constructed identity that doesn't want responsibility, that doesn't want real awareness or knowledge, that doesn't want a direct encounter with reality, but wants to at least feel better than the, everyone else, <laughs> right? which actually enlightenment doesn't get, get, give you. I mean, you can't attain enlightenment whilst um, simultaneously feeling self-important uh, or, or feeling separate even. I mean, somewhat speculating because I haven't attained it, but from my, you know, my proximity to it, let's say, however close I've managed to get, that definitely seems to be baked into the, the, uh, the nature of it. One has to transcend one's own sense of self-importance and of separateness. So, but what, if you worship a guru, um, who has become the ultimate somebody really, then you get, you get the the breadcrumbs. You know, you get to you don't get to sit at the table. You get to sit under the table like a dog, but you do get the breadcrumbs, and the breadcrumbs are enough, I think, for many of these people. So it is in their interest to raise up the one that they worship because they feel that they're being raised up also, even though paradoxically, the the nature of that deal is that they'll always be subjugant. They'll always be in a lower position. Uh, and and it, it just, I mean, that's really central to the template, I would say, uh, of what we're talking about. And um, if, if if you see the opposite of that, or, or uh, an arrangement where that doesn't exist, you really notice the difference. Again, bringing back to Dave Oshana, there's a very few people in this group that is a concerted avoidance of worshipful position you know he doesn't answer questions for example there's nothing like satsangs he's constantly uh 
challenging everyone who's involved to stand up, to step up, to do it themselves. Uh, there isn't much, um, well, the kind of satisfaction that I'm talking about, which is really, I would say, that the, the sort of spirituality that is prevalent and that does lead to abuses and all the rest of it, for the majority who are being more subtly abused rather than directly abused, it's a kind of high-level entertainment where they feel, like, and this is the cult thing, they feel like they're part of some epic cosmic spiritual drama in which mm -hmm. they have proximity and somewhat direct access, but only in very controlled conditions, to, to the hub, the center point, the enlightened God person. Um, but, but all they have to do, well, there might be disciplines and all the rest of it. So I'm not saying some of those cults have very rigorous disciplines and that's not healthy either. Um, so, so yeah, I don't want to oversimplify it because sometimes it does involve, uh, it involves more than just sitting, right, and staring at somebody. Um, but in either case, there's a kind of abjugation of responsibility and a disempowerment by which a person defers their own um, progress, their own journey to self-awareness to the leader. And essentially, as long as the leader just keeps doing his or her thing and they keep loyal to it, they feel secure. Mm. That's, that's a, an infantile kind of relationship. Mm. Mm. Well, the phrase that you mentioned John's followers use quite a lot, and this was Mr. M's bunch used this a lot as well, is sitting at his feet. Yeah. By sitting at his feet, you know, we're getting... Which is just such a, a demeaning way to talk about your own position in relation to someone else, you know. It's it's a sort of, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sitting at his feet like a child. Uh, you know, as you say, sort of being thrown these little breadcrumbs. I even remember there was a song that they used to sing. It was like, At Your Lotus Feet. Mm -hmm. My Mind is Quiet or something. Um, uh, the songs that they used to sing also bring up a, a, a point you make in Dark Oasis about the the question of taste and that you realised maybe there was something wrong. One of the points that not this wasn't obviously the catalyst, but one there was a certain point of doubt that um, was related to John's favourable review of Avatar. Was it Avatar? Yeah, it was. Hang on, how can an enlightened being have such terrible tastes? I think that was a good <laughs> film, and that was a moment. That was a, a moment that I had with Mr. Rem. Actually, it was like, how can he tolerate these awful singers around him? Hmm. Another thing was he didn't dance. When I found out that John couldn't dance, I just thought, well, hold on, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> the alarm bell's ringing. Yeah, it's it's a it's a dilemma because yeah, I would say somebody who ends up following John, it's unfortunate that they fall on, into that trap out of a genuine desire to get to the truth. Uh, but at least they were looking. Whereas the people who would dismiss John and then dismiss the people who fall for somebody like that, nine times out of ten, they're not even really looking. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm having this recurring struggle myself with uh, like what I'm doing, which is back to writing books, or not writing, I've finished them now, but back to publishing a couple of books this year and possibly going back to Dark Oasis and still on Twitter and still writing newsletters and things like this, when it's less clear why, and um, I'm less and less clear, like, 
why people are interested in what I do. I mean, I understand if they want to read another book by Horsley, fair enough. But I don't quite understand that if they really appreciate the books and really if they got what I attempted to put in them, they got what I attempted to deliver through those books, um, then they should want more than just more books. <laughs> right? Um, and, and really, it's so, it's so few out of those few thousand readers, followers, listeners, uh, so few who ever really, I mean, even email me, but of those who email it, I mean, it's such a few who really uh, engage with with the quest. Well, as far as I can tell, I mean, they could be doing it somewhere else, but then I would think that I would hear about it because we would be more or less on the same page, even though we were had different specific foci. Uh, but my sense is really that I'm just entertainment to these people, to most of them, or some sort of distraction, really. And and so then I think, well, why why bother? You know, why bother to 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 create content for these people. As you know, I stopped doing the podcast. Um, but that wasn't why I stopped doing the podcast. So I just wanted to focus more on you know, away from the computer activities. And um, what I'm involved with Dave O'Shana in doing together and the meetings around that. Uh, but... Um, Yeah, I mean, I just suspect it's kind of the this thing of cults, really, is, is that people can, can look down on cults and think, well, I'd never fall for that. But what are they involved with? Mm. And can you, can you really get, because I don't think we can do it alone, number one. I think we need other, other people, other souls to connect to some sort of community that might be online to begin with, but eventually could be a real community. Uh, and number two, although number two might be number one here, I don't, I don't think we can do it without some sort of guidance from somebody who has, has actually made it out of both matrices and actually knows what it's like on the outside. So, although I wasn't looking for anyone who was enlightened when I met Dave Oshana and then when I fell for John Deruta, I certainly was looking for somebody who could help me get out of the matrix. I mean, to use a really bad analogy now that both Wachowskis cut their dicks off uh, hopefully I won't get you censored for that one um, Neo, Thomas Anderson would have got nowhere without Morpheus literally just wouldn't have had a clue right, there was no way in that parable for for Thomas to, to make it out of the matrix without somebody on the outside coming in and fishing him out now, I'm not saying that's absolutely categorically the case, because well, there's got to be some sort of spontaneous awakenings. Otherwise, you know, where's it going to begin? It has to begin somewhere. Um, and as far as I know about David Shana, he, he didn't have any uh, specific help. I mean, there were various, obviously, he met loads of people, but his awakening seemed to have to do with a very early sense of what the things he shouldn't do. So he didn't do any, hardly anything at all that harmed his body from a very young age. And and as far as I can tell, that, that might have been it. That might have been enough. Not that anyone who doesn't harm their body is going to get in line, but a combination of having a, a, a very clear sense of seeking a way out with the sense that he, he shouldn't do anything to harm his body, that he needed to retain physical purity to attain that exit route or to achieve that exit. He, he did self enlighten, I think, or he did create the right circumstances for the Holy Spirit to enlighten him, however you want to frame that. But that's very, very exceptional. It's so exceptional, I think. And so I'd say, if, if, you know, in, in almost every other case, we absolutely do need somebody who's outside of the illusion, who's awakened from the dream to enter in and find us and to to guide us. I absolutely think that's the case. And I, but I know that most of the people who listen to me or read me and probably for you too, they don't believe that and they won't believe it and they don't want to believe it. 
And so I wonder if, if there's anything that can communicate at the end of the day, really. Yeah, the, mm. the only thing I communicate really has to include that, like where all of this seeking has led me. It hasn't led me yet to freedom, but it's at least led me to somebody who has found freedom. And, and there's there's no worship for attitude in that. It's, it's purely pragmatic. It's a purely mm. pragmatic thing. Like if you if you're in if you're lost in the forest and you've got absolutely no clue which is the way out, uh, and you run into somebody who's who who exists outside the forest and just came in to see if they could find anyone, of course you say, Can I go with you? <laughs> right? What are you you're not gonna go, fuck off, I can do it on my own. It's ridiculous. Mm. Now, of course to be skeptical, maybe they're lying and maybe it's a trap. I'm not saying you should ever lose that, and I'm not saying I don't still have that. I could, it could be a trick, it could be a trap, but so far, I mean, Dave O'Shana thing, like, like John's thing was, but so far, um, it's been, what has it been, 15 years of close observation and constant, steady um, improvement of, in, at every level, really, except my physical, that's because I'm getting older. Um, and and no evidence whatsoever of of any sort of deception or corruption or compromised uh, you know compromised behaviour, uh, and, and and this is somebody who has really good developed very good eyes for that through my experiences with all of these false teachers. So, but yeah, it, it, one one does never lose one's sense that one could be being played. Uh, of course, mm. that's the nature of neti neti, constantly saying, no, it's not this, it's not this, right? So with Dave Oshana, I am constantly saying no to things he says in, internally. I'm like checking, checking, no, that's not, not that it's not true, but that that's not, I'm not going to take that literally, I'm not, right? As for, in terms of advice mm. or guidance, I, I, I don't, I mean, I thought this recently, I thought I would say it more in an affinity group rather than a public place, but I, there's nothing that Dave says that I believe because he says it. Absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. The only things that he says that I believe are things that I've, I've already corroborated or can corroborate. And then I'm like, okay, it's interesting that he's saying that because that happens to be true, <laughs> right? Rather than it must be true because he says it. It's, it's, mm. and that, uh, you know, most people don't have the, that faculty of discernment, I suppose, and maybe they know they don't have it. And so the idea of somebody who claims to be enlightened, uh, the assumption is, well, they must be claiming that everything they say is true and that we have to just listen, sit at their feet and listen and obey. And right, there's all kinds of baggage around this idea of having any sort of spiritual guide, and never mind one who claims to be enlightened. Um, that sort of ironically that prevents people I think from because they know they can't trust themselves they don't want to trust anyone else I think mm. uh, and there is a kernel of truth in that and it's it's ironic to me that there are people who trust me and think that, that I have something they can learn from and be guided by although to be honest hard, not enough of those hardly any these days um, for whatever reason things have changed in the last couple of years but uh, it's ironic that they will might see me that way, but they won't see Dave that way. Like I'm somehow seem more trustworthy to them, mainly perhaps because I don't wear white and I don't claim to be enlightened. Um, but I will charge money for you know one to one, and uh, you know why wouldn't I be? I do, I do have experience and wisdom to offer, and it it's it's important to me that I can do that, uh, and can assist others on their um self liberation process um but but my main impetus generally is to to try and encourage them to go to Dave because he's much closer to where it's at um anyway i uh, went into that whole ramble i'm not sure exactly what the context was but just i think that this whole subject is problematic, really, because one can talk about the dodgy aspects of spirituality or the spiritual marketplace and the teachers and student relationships, etc., etc. But the only reason to do so is to drain the 
bath water to reveal the baby. It's not to toss the baby out too, because then well, why bother? You know, just just leave her if you're gonna, right? But so if it's not to mm. save the baby, then why drain the bath water? Right? If it's not to, um, if the reason the reason to to show what's wrong in the spiritual marketplace is to be better able to discern what's right and what's true in there. Right? However tiny, vanishingly small and hard to find it is, it's obviously impossible to find if we can't tell the difference between the real thing and the counterfeit. Hmm. So, I mean, lots of people are turning to religion now, you know, Orthodox Christianity. So there is a, some sort of spiritual renaissance. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how much faith I have in that, really. It's something. Mm-hmm. I suppose, I mean, it just comes down to us as individuals, doesn't it? I mean, you've got your podcast, we're doing a podcast. Uh, is it helping? Is it making a difference? Like, can we reach one person, one soul out there who who is actually going to start to reorientate themselves towards the light that I or you are, are also trying to find, but perhaps are slightly more oriented towards? Well, it's... Uh... It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, I wouldn't say tricky question, it's not a tricky question, it's just a, it's a big question, put it like that, it's a very big question, a very pertinent one, very profound. Um, I have a certain possibly naive sense that most people on some level are on some sort of incremental journey towards where they should be going. But it could be very gradual. I mean, like cosmic eons gradual. But at the same time, there is a sort of very just, you know, Perhaps I'm one of them. This is the sort of slow, you know, incremental, just bit by bit. Everyone also has, I suspect, their own unique way and their own unique, um, or a set of unique routes, possibly. I don't know. I, I this is, I this, is like, this is like your inoculation against cult mentality, I think. Because it's the opposite. What you're expressing there is the opposite of cult mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wonder if it's not overcautious. Because it sounds a bit, a bit. I could say woke, but you really wouldn't like that. But you know what I mean. This is liberalism, isn't it? It's liberalism. Live and let live. Everyone's got their way. But it it veers. It gets dangerously close to everyone has their own truth, which I think is hogwash. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to take it to a sort of liberal extent. I, I, I don't think there's only one way, put it like that. Well, it depends I on what you mean. I mean, I certainly don't think everyone has to go to Devo Shana because <laughs> mm. as I, said, I would leave if they did. But, and I'm not even like he's not even that he's got the template necessarily, but pretty close. I mean, in the sense that I said everybody, we all need a group of people who are oriented towards reality, and and that group needs a leader. I would say that's the only way. I, I just would, because yeah. what's the other way? I mean, tell me, I'm I'm open to hearing, yeah. but what would it look like? Um. Well, I suppose the incremental way I was speculating about just then could be in very broad, in a very broad sense, the school of hard knocks. Well, yeah, we're all in that school. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I suppose, I mean, so, but isn't it to do also what, what point we are historically, evolutionarily, uh, et cetera, environmentally? I don't really like any of those terms at all, actually. But certainly as for an individual body, yeah, time runs out. We know that. Why, why wouldn't it run out for a society? Of course it would. Uh, uh, why not for a species? So I think it also depends there on how you feel about that, because I feel very strongly and always have that we're really close to, to uh, the end, just to keep it simple. So, so the increment, I'm not sure how much of incremental awakening is, is an option, really. Uh, I, I should perhaps mention that my um, my strong suspicion is that we reincarnate. Uh, so yeah, but into the, this the, world, I mean, you want to come back into this world post Great Reset, tran- a transhumanist. I mean, there won't be any bodies to come into that aren't technologically, uh, you know, plugged in. I. I, I I doubt that it will get to that point. I'm not. I'm not convinced by the Great Reset. I think that it's probably not going to succeed. That's my own. That's my sense at the moment. I, I may update that with with new information. But my sense of how things are going right now, my experience of technology and general social infrastructure, is that um, it, it, it's. I'm actually not that concerned about the 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 long term future of the technocracy. I'm I'm more concerned about uh the long term future of what happens when the technocracy have have done the damage they've done and have gone the way of all flesh. And then what happens after that is that that somewhat somewhat concerns me. What's about what's behind the technocracy? Um, That's something I don't have at this point direct knowledge of, but I have a sense that there's a... You might be referring to something spiritual or or kind of more subtle than the technocracy uh, presents itself to be. Yeah, the powers and principalities of darkness. Yeah. So, the same Paul wrote about. Because um, if if they exist, which I have no doubt at all about, and I don't think anyone in the right mind should have any doubt about, because uh, the, the evidence is everywhere. Uh, and if they've seen the technology, if the technology have become their most visible implement or sock pu- puppet. <clears throat> Well, what like is it, is it a strategical error, or is it that they they know something we don't, or that it's a disposable sock pu- pu- puppet while they prepare the right the next thing? Or I think it's is it I mean because I understand the thing about the great set not working to some degree, I suppose I don't know if I understand it, but I've heard it before. Um, so, but, but essentially you're saying you're optimistic because you think the whole thing's going to collapse and we're just going to go back to feudal times and people will just be ripping each other's guts out for the next few thousand years. Is that your op- optimistic point? If you, could, if you call that optimism, then I'll take that, yeah. <laughs> well, I do, I do. That would be an optimistic perspective from, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that as being as being, you know, uh, relative optimism, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't. I, I'm getting to the point where I, I don't know if the technocrats really understand what it is they're doing, or that. That, I mean, obviously, these these things are public facing, so we don't we can't draw conclusions from the videos of the Davos conferences and that sort of thing. But the videos I've seen of the Davos conferences, uh, I'm not impressed by the calibre of these people. Even as dark overlords, I'm not impressed by them. 
This is what my wife is always saying. She's saying that the Henry Kissinger generation of social engineers, they're all dying off and the next generation, they're all incompetent, relatively speaking. And my, mm. my point of view is that it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, I mean, look at W. Like W was apparently incompetent. Even Reagan seemed incompetent, but it didn't really matter because the things behind those guys were, were, were efficient. Now, okay, Kissinger was the guy behind W or Reagan, what have you. So which we are talking maybe a higher level uh, are also becoming incompetent. But, but again, if the, if what's really behind, if we go far enough behind the scenes, do demons become incompetent over time? It's possible they do. I mean, they might, because they get more and more entrenched in an impossible revolt against God. Um, but I still don't see any happy outcome in that regard for human beings. Not in the short term, I would agree. I, I would agree that I think that regardless of how competent these technocrats are, whatever happens, there's going to be a lot of suffering because, um, you know, a, a botched evil plan isn't exactly necessarily going to lead to much less suffering than a successful evil plan. No. If you botch an evil if you make it, if you make it, if you make a doomsday device and it goes off in your face, then you know you still set off a doomsday device. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, even if we just look at what's happened in the last three years, I don't know how many billion people have taken some experimental nanotechnology into their bodies that may be capable of things that you know only the highest level of military medical industry no uh and even then maybe not so and that's that's keeping it at a, a, a you know a low level paranoia yeah you know, my my paranoia is very high level it's you know it's it's the book of revelation rudolf steiner Araman, as you know that's the kind of paranoia that i try to operate at. and i have to david shana also that that there are ancient malevolent entities from Satan on down who are manipulating human history and human beings towards an end point in which all human bodies are completely controlled so that the souls can be harvested by those beings and the bodies used, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that's, that's my point of view. And so the, the, the technocracy is, like ripples on the surface, essentially, or, or even you know, floating flotsam on the surface. I mean, to some extent, it's the means, but it's certainly not the end. Certainly not the end. But anyway, if we stay just at the flotsam and the surface, isn't it? Isn't it sobering that in just two or three years, that almost the entire population, or well, whatever it is, it's more than half, I think, have taken technology into their body and, and would do again. Mm. And that there is a concerted effort towards this thing called the Internet of Bodies. Whether it, the idea that it's supposed to lead to a planet that's completely uh, computer cybernetically controlled of billions of people or not, this, this, we don't know that. I mean, it could, it could, there could be a planned die off where 90% uh, of those people, bodies just die. But then the, the few that survive, they've all been implanted with the tech. And they can be herded up and turned into a slave labor force for some breakaway civilization, et cetera, et cetera. But the grand plan being essentially that nobody could be born here that isn't born straight into the brave new world where it's physically uh, invaded so that no sentience can enter into it. So you as a reincarnating soul are, are in some limbo. There's no access to, to a body anymore. That's it. That, that, I don't find that hard to, to believe, considering uh, what we are being told. Of course, it could be a bluff. I'm not really that out either, but it's very confusing because it seems as a well, part of it suppressing how much technology and power that they do have, uh, but another mm. part seems to be exaggerating it and you know, making it seem more efficient than it is. Um, but it, it could mm. be both. I mean, I don't think someone like Harari uh, 
is really in the loop or Bill Gates. I don't think of those guys as being really players. I think of them as being um, not patsies, but, you know, useful idiots. Mm. Uh, so, or, yeah. Unless they are just demonic vessels. End of story. I mean, I don't rule that either. I mean, it could be both. It would be both, essentially. If somebody's a, a vessel for demons, whatever residue of human consciousness they have is, is a sucker, right? <laughs> They're being told, yes, you will benefit. Yes, you will have power over all the nations, but they won't. Mm. Yeah, that that would be where I'd lean to what I'd lean towards um, suspecting would be that that the demonic voices that are whispering in the ears of the technocracy and all these sorts of people and Bill Gates and Yuva Harari Harari incidentally really reminds me of Renfield from Bram Stoker's Dracula that he's this sort of seems like he's just hanging around with the vampires hoping that you know Really? They'll eventually provide him with eternal life. As so if he is sufficiently slavish and sycophantic to them that they'll sort of <laughs> they'll spare him once they exterminate the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's really quite quite pitiful to see. Um, but that I, I suspect that a lot of this demonic influence is, uh, as you were suggesting just then, a sort of itself flattery and just like you know ah, if you te- create this technology you'll have control over all these people maybe or maybe not maybe the technology will just fuck everyone up and there'll just be a, a horrible situation of chaos and mass die-offs and most likely there is some some control but is it is it total i don't know you know there seems to be reports of some interaction between the substances that are are put into some of these pseudo vaccines and 5G, you know, I haven't confirmed any of that, but I don't rule it out, you know, and there may be, having said that, I know enough people who are vaccinated, who are skeptical of the whole thing, and who regret getting the vaccine and who don't seem to at this point be, you know, suddenly mouthing um, how we should all go and buy Yuval Harari books and things like that. So I haven't seen, I haven't seen direct evidence of that sort of control yet Mm. myself, but it doesn't necessarily mean it won't happen. Sure. Sure, well, it is pretty much impossible to gauge what's going on on the planet of 8 billion bodies, of course. We're just getting the second and third hand information about it, which is all mostly propaganda anyway. Um, so, but what, what does all this begin as? So, you know, the not being only one way. Uh, I mean, there's only one way to escape the system, and that's to go back to nature. I mean, that seems like a good example, really. Mm. There's, there's only one way there, so why wouldn't there be only one, one way in, in other ways as well? It seems to me that there's... <clears throat> I mean, if you think of the difference between getting your food on your land, growing your own food and going to a supermarket. In the supermarket, in cultures, the superculture civilization, there's many, many options. That's what it's made of. In nature, there aren't. Okay, you might have more than one vegetable, hopefully, but basically you you can only eat the vegetables you can grow. So in that sense, there's only one option. You eat the vegetables you can grow. You go to the supermarket, you can have anything you want. So it seems to me that this is a bit netty netty as well. Like in, in Satan's counterfeit of reality, there's a million options. There's a reality for each one of us. This is Steiner's view of our man as well, that he would fragment us to the point that each individual had his own universe. 
Um, and obviously transgender and postmodernism and wokeism, it's all about that. You customize your own reality according to your personal whim and desire, create your own safe space in which nobody can say anything that you disagree with without being executed, right? Everyone is a dictator of their own pseudo reality, Lucifer reigns in hell, etc., etc. Whereas reality is the opposite of that. It's just God's mm. will. That's it. Right? Whatever. And it, of course, everyone is individual. Everyone has their own uh, expression of that. And was, uh, that's the complementary um, symmetry. It's paradoxical as well. Because, because in the Arimanic superculture, where everyone has their own universe, uh, everyone is basically the same. They're just like uh, mm-hmm. you know, drones in a hive, little copies of one another. But uh, because they're all possessed by the same monoculture, whereas in the natural reality where there's only one way, there's, there's true individuality. It's very paradoxical. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, something that that is making me think of is the the problem we have in our culture with the notion of limit which is that, you know, you're talking about what the land around you can grow. Well, that's a limit. There's a limited number of plants that can grow in this area. You know, there's a limited um, spectrum of animals and, you know, other forms of uh, terrain that can be in this particular area. But modern culture doesn't like that. Superculture doesn't like limits because everything has to be limitless. You know, there's even a film called Limitless. And if you talk about if you um, use it, if you try to come up with an advertising slogan, you're going to be more likely to use something like limitless possibility, like you know, unlimited things that can happen because you use this deodorant or whatever it is. Um, but that's that's the sort of the kind of um, the neurosis of our culture, sort of, um, you know, simultaneously luciferic and aromatic system we're talking about, sort of the aromatic superstructure of tech, creating this sort of micro world with the luciferic energy of like I'm the, you know, I'm the the dictator of my reality. I can just, you know, I have no limits. Um, yeah yeah and having no limits is no boundaries as well so um, well everything just loses its shape and form and its meaning essentially as we're seeing with the transgender thing if you can't if if a woman is anyone who defines themselves as a woman um then what's the definition of a woman? There isn't one. So you're defining yourself as something that can't be defined, which is it in a nutshell, mm. is what people want. I don't want to be defined. You know, Don't oppress me with your definitions, man. Uh, but if you don't, uh, if two and two no longer equals four, then you can't engineer anything. Like nothing, the bridges literally start collapsing, which they literally are, although not because of wokeism actually, just because they're falling apart. But the new bridges won't, won't last a day because you, you know, mathematics is white supremacy. So, mm. uh, and the, so, so it's the opposite of observing the law of matter, which is, as you say, that's all about limits. That's what matter is. It's, it's a structure of limits or a system of limitations. Um, that uh, give us, they, they define us, I and mean, they give us a sense, they give the soul a sense of existing. In fact, get quite fanciful here, but what if the soul can only really come into existence as a soul through through the limitations of the body? Like, what if that's the whole purpose of physical existence is for souls to uh, come into existence through incarnating mm-hmm. as bodies? And that, that's true individuality when a, when a portion of, of infinite consciousness takes finite form like Christ on the cross and is, and is, uh, momentarily, temporarily pinned or shaped or formed or defined 
by that physical incarnation and by the acts it does, that soul then for, thereby potentially comes into existence as a soul, as opposed to just, you know, infinite consciousness that is, is momentarily here and then gone. What if that's the whole thing there, like keeps this world as a veil of soul making? Then, uh, then we're, we're being tricked into the very opposite by which souls can't ever be formed. They can't ever incarnate. Um, because the law of matter is being um, defied. It's being defied in, a, in every possible way. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the end game, you know, to, to manipulate matter. But at a cognitive level, human beings, we've been propagandized in this way that you're saying, where we don't want to accept limits uh, in, in any shape or form, so we're not, the only way to really live a life where we don't bump up against limits is to uncouple ourselves from the laws of matter, i.e. physical mm. nature, reality, and uncouple ourselves from our bodies. Because even if you sit at your computer all day, you're going to get aches and pains and tunnel, corporal sh- elbow, whatever it's called, these kind of things that will remind you of physical. So that's not enough, you know, uh, enter the metaverse. Just download mm. the computer. Now, whether that's physically possible is obviously a real question. I mean, so obviously, it's not physically possible, but it certainly is possible for people to just get more and more immersed to the point that they already are. As they write about in 60 Maps of Hell, wearing nappies or peeing into soda bottles while not moving from their computers for 36 hours or what have you, and with the VR and all the rest of it. So they're actually not physically experiencing their bodies hardly at all. Now that's a literal thing, but it's also a metaphor because somebody who goes transgender, well, they're having their body altered in ways that they don't have a real penis or a real vagina. Uh, so it can't possibly act or respond or feel or experience like it. Well, potentially the whole body could end up being re-engineered in that way that there's, there's no real sense of being a body like one starts to experience consciousness starts to experience itself as being in a synthetic home mm. uh and thereby it's compl- it's numbed out and again there's no reminder there's no reminder so that that's my sense of how close we are to being lost because it's quite a broad spectrum from very extreme things that we're the technology we don't even know if it works yet but we're hearing the rumors and and so on mm. to well, you and I sitting at a computer, like having a virtual conversation, and you know, what everybody's doing all day, every day now, is is already quite virtualized. Um, mm. So, if that's incremental, if that's uh, accumulative, um, what state are the gener- you know the new generations, the new the latest generations? What state are they in? being born into that world through bodies that are already disconnected from real, physical reality uh, and giving a cell phone, giving a cell phone to play with at the age of two, even outside of the mRNA invasions. Uh, it seems to me that we can overestimate how advanced it is if we get, if we believe the propaganda a bit too much and we get too David Icke, but we can also underestimate it just even more easily, I think, in terms of the subtler the subtler accumulative effect of living in a dissociated society where there just isn't uh, the opportunity to for the soul to have a sense of existing incarnate because of all these um, uh, endless distractions. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I'm a pessimist. I mean, I'm a pessimist, but 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 I I cling to it because oh, I don't know, hopefully I don't cling to it, but I hope, you know I stick to it and maintain the position of pessimism because it is my optimism. I don't quite know if I can explain that, but I, I suppose it has to do with the idea that uh, we shouldn't get away with it. Like for the things I see that we're doing to ourselves, we shouldn't get away with it. I don't want us to get away with it. Uh, so, and that I have this sense that there'll only really be a reckoning 
when we reach the point, you know, the omega point of the singularity through through Luciferian will, when Lucifer shows himself and our man, only then will the soul rise up and say no, whatever's left of it. Right. So I have a kind of poetic eschatological Christian Steiner mm. sense that we we have to get to this point. Somehow it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, I mean, that's that's an element of faith. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to explain the conund- the paradox of my pessimism mm-hmm. being optimism. Is that it seems to me that Satan, the adversary, the anti-life force, uh, until it fully reveals itself through an apparent triumph over the human body and spirit and mind, uh, then then the it won't it can't be dismantled. Mm. But somehow those two okay. things are simultaneous. In a sense, then I could see that as having a core of optimism. Then, well, yeah, that was that was the point I was trying to make. That my optimism, yeah. my, my optimism yeah, seems like pessimism because I'm saying that yeah. yes, Satan's going to take over the whole planet and everyone's going to be enslaved, but that's necessary for God to step in because basically well, it's game over really uh, I better just save it's like Sodom and Gomorrah I better just save t- t- the last few souls now that have, have managed to say no mm. Mm. Is it? yeah yeah yeah. Uh, I, I, I get that I, I, that could well be how it plays out um, I have I have well, I have ideas about it but i don't know um it's 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 good to hear that perspective because i'm usually the one who's trying to convince other people that i'm actually an optimist at the core of my pessimism right. um so it's nice to be on the other side of that <laughs> once um but um yeah I, I don't really have much to add to that i think that's a yeah well expressed and very evocative image um, of the end time scenario, and I, uh, I think that's it. Seems to be as good a possibility as any other that I've seen at the moment. Well, it does require a certain amount of faith, and maybe it's a bit. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know where all the Christian stuff, you know, how that took root in me as much as it did. Uh, when it was questioning if the shoe fits, what have you. But to my sense, I mean, the point you made about the vaccine or the mRNA thing is is irrelevant. <clears throat> I don't know many people that you're talking about, but then I don't know many people who took it in the first place, I'm glad to say. Um, but um, my sense is, is that it's going to take a bit more than just, oh, maybe it wasn't a good idea, you know? Mm-hmm. Like if somebody was fell for that the first t- the last time around, and okay, they, they regret it because they realise it was hasty. That doesn't mean they won't fall for the next one. Is my sense, unless they have a really strong. Oh my God, I cannot believe what I did to myself. Then, then yeah. I would really then I'd feel there might be hope that for that person and more more generally. Um, Otherwise, it seems like too little, too late to me. And, and I don't know exactly collectively as well. Like there seems to be more and more awareness about that, that it was not a good idea, the mRNA and you know, mainstream reporting. But I, I just haven't. Has it really led to a sea change? I don't think so. It still seems there's no. two camps. There's the camp that says Bill Gates is trying to kill us all camp. And then there's the camp that says... Uh, no, trust trust the science. Okay, well, the science made a bit of a blunder there, but we should still trust them. Uh, maybe there's a maybe there's a somewhere a middle thing in between. Um, but anyway, neither camp is good anyway. Right? It's, it's it's no one's paranoid enough, or hardly anyone's paranoid enough, as I see it. And that mm. that's where the Christian thing comes in, because I think mm. the Satan is a necessary metaphor regardless of whether you consider it to point to a reality or not, 
for the, what we're up against, the force that we're up against is individual consciousnesses. It's something that is every bit as um, uh, prodigious or formidable an, an adversary as, as the metaphorical Satan. That, that's mm. what I always come back to that. I think anyone who's not really factoring in. So and it is, it's, it's, it's not a, a, an easy match between technocracy and Satan because one wouldn't want to imbue the technocracy with the kind of wisdom and cunning and, you know, power and uh, even, you know, spiritual dimensions of Satan. But to just repeat my former point, if, if the technocracy is seen as a useful tool for this ancient force of evil, then I think we should respect that. We need to respect that. Like they, they, they must be a useful tool, right? Uh, even if they look like incompetent lunatics to us, and if it seems impossible, mm. um, then it probably means there's something we haven't seen. Right? There's something that's unfolding now that that all the David Ikes and the uh, Alex Jones and the Russell Browns, the controlled opposition is giving us, even if we don't trust those guys, but even you and I talking, might be giving a false sense of knowing what's unfolding. Whereas really, you know, what's that's a distraction like the magician's slate of hand. We're looking this way and then, you know, something else gets uh, sprung on us from our blind side. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's a few episodes of this podcast back. I spoke to a woman called Kimberly Steele and she described some experiences she's had of encountering uh, the spirits of the deceased who'd taken the vaccine. And they were really not happy in the afterlife because it it turned turned out that it was a sort of a pact that they'd kind of signed a form without reading the blueprint, as it were. As it were. And um, it's the the hitches that it creates aren't necessarily completely insurmountable, but that they are from the experiences she's had of talking to uh, entities that seem to be spirits of the deceased, but that they are, it does create some, some problems there. Um, that's one, one anecdote. That's one person's anecdotal experience. You know, um, she says herself, you know, I don't know. I could be wrong, but this was what, what seemed to be revealed to me. Mm. Um, that, that has always been my, as you know, we've, we've spoken about it quite a few times now, but my, my fear with specifically the vaccines was that it was a kind of spiritual technology. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I took, and not to drag this on much past the two-hour thing, but I don't think I talked to you since I went to the Oshana retreat and I caught what may have been COVID because a number of people caught almost everyone got ill and a number of people took the test which obviously are notoriously unreliable but anyway i did get something that might well have been identified as covid and was unlike any kind of illness i've had and this is somebody who's been ill for a very long time i mean many times in his life um and uh it it really did leave me in a state of i would say unprecedented spiritual emptiness for a period like i felt cut off from absolutely almost any sense of spiritual meaning or purpose it's just just like being hollowed out and turned into this barely sentient replicant version of myself which is what people have said maybe that the mrna would cause but if if um you know if the covid or various different bioweapons that get grouped together as COVID, uh, if they're designed in laboratories as weapons that do have a energetic dimension that connects the body to the spirit, because I don't think the spirit can ever be harmed by any kind of technology, but our energetic connection to it certainly could be sabotaged, uh, then that might have been what I was experiencing. That, that certainly doesn't seem beyond the bounds of possibility i mean there doesn't seem any doubt that 
that there would be an attempt to design such weapons. Uh, mm. It doesn't seem surprising to me. I mean, even psychedelics, I've written at length about how they disrupt the energetic bodies that connects the body, the physical body to the soul. Therefore, psychedelics can cut us off from, from our souls by giving us a surrogate experience of them. Uh, and that's psychedelics. I mean, those, those are based in nature. So God only knows what kind of things they could design in a laboratory. Mm. So, yeah, I think, I mean, it's a very, they're very high stakes. I would agree with the, at least with the implications of what your associates said there without obviously being able to confirm the specifics that the ramifications of our choices almost certainly extend beyond this life and uh, that, that choosing to trust a satanic system to do things to your body that you know nothing about seems highly likely to have, you know, unusually profound ramifications. Mm. Mm. And again, I think it should. I mean, it should. Not that, not because I think people should be punished, but because that you can't. If you, if you, it's all part of a, a system, like aligning oneself with reality and with God. Uh, if there wasn't consequences for not doing it, it wouldn't mean anything, would it? I guess you can't have the one without the other. Essentially, you can't have the value of aligning with truth without the consequences of not doing so. 